Hi, my name is Dr. Cash Brzezada. I'm pleased to present the first installment of What's Next, charting the future of the pandemic in Canada. Uh, basically, I wanted to introduce our group, Mass for Canada. We are a group of professionals and volunteers across the country. Um, we haven't, um, you know, we have no support from government or corporations. We are entirely independent. Uh, we act as independent advisors, and our main goal throughout this pandemic has been to try to minimize the loss of life as much as possible. Um, we have played a leading role in advocating for the recognition that SARS is, uh, SARS-2 is airborne. Um, we've had open letters and petitions to that effect. Unfortunately, that message is not being heeded, and we hope it will uh, shortly. Uh, you can visit our website at massforcanada.org to get more information. Basically, um, to introduce myself, uh, this is not my first uh, coronavirus. Um, I was a medical student during the SARS epidemic in Toronto in 2003. I, along with half of my classmates, were exposed to SARS a virus much deadlier than COVID and, you know, contemplating my life while under quarantine was probably one of the most defining experiences of my life and is one of the reasons why I've been so active during this pandemic. Uh, to be clear, I'm not an immunologist. I'm an emergency physician. Um, I have academic affiliations with the University of Toronto and McMaster University. I appear regularly on national media as an expert on the COVID-19. Um, uh, to disclose, I also am a founder and CEO of Raven, a social media startup, um, and the information is in my bio about that. Um, and just a bit about emergency physicians, um, generally, um, we know a lot about, we know a little bit about a lot of different things. Um, you know, it, we generally know enough to pester consultants to accept patients. So we can keep almost anyone alive for a short amount of time until we can, um, uh, refer to other specialists. The other thing is, uh, we are very often wrong, um, and we will admit that quickly and we will pivot and try to find a better solution. And so if there's anything wrong in what you're about to see, please uh, comment on social media. Um, and we, the other famous thing about us is that we have very short attention spans. So this immunology review that you're going to see attached to this uh, lecture uh, was the product of uh, a, lot of, a lot of different reading. And I probably got a lot of things wrong. So please let me know. So our first lecture is going to be about our T cells, um, that the T cells are not all right. Um, this is going to include an interview with Dr. Anthony Leonardi, a T cell scientist. Um, the, the, real, the real topic should be, why isn't this pandemic over already? I thought, you know, we all thought that the two-shot vaccination should have ended this by now. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to go into some reasons why this didn't happen and why we'll have to take care in the future to really, really understand the, the immunology behind the reasoning about why this pandemic isn't over yet. Um, first, we're going to do a review of um, basic immunology concepts, and we're going to go through step-by-step step some of the topics that Dr. Leonardi will cover in the interview, which will follow, follow this review. Um, basically, this is the immune system as, as you've probably understood it, as I've understood it. Um, this is commonly presented in the media that, you know, you have your, um, your first line of uh, defense, which is your, you know, NPIs, your masks, um, your ventilation, your rapid tests. Uh, the second line is your innate immunity, um, uh, your antibodies. This can quickly, um, you know, uh, attack and, and prevent infection in the first place or quickly kill it off if it does infect you. That's your, your second line. And then, you know, the final line we've been told are your, your T cells. These are complex cells that can recognize and kill off pathogens. And there's a potent army that's all over your body ready to fight and, and is protecting you against severe disease, even if the variants are getting through the first, uh, first two layers. What we'll go over in this lecture is that the reality is, some, is much more complex. Um, a lot of the, the first line is being removed in a lot of Western countries. Uh, masks um, are being phased out. Testing is hard and hard, getting harder to get. The second line, the innate immunity, um, the virus basically walks right through innate immunity. And especially as variants become more and more mutated, um, the, uh, they're increasingly disabled by the virus. Um, so you have um, reduced antibody, um, uh, basically, uh, ability to control infection uh, with Omicron variants and especially with the, the second Omicron variant. And then this is the final uh, piece that we're going to go over in this lecture is that your T cells, far from protecting you from severe illness, can often damage you, are the agents of damage in your body, especially if you're older, especially if you're immune compromised or in vulnerable position. So that, that's what we're going to go over. So your immune system is not as protective as you thought it was, um, and this is what you'll have to take into account um, going forward. 
Now, just to go over um, some of the common criticisms um, that Dr. Leonardi has run into, that he doesn't have a lab of his own, he's quite junior, and he is. He's a PhD graduate. He has not done a postdoc, but if you look at the way academic titles are structured, um, very often researchers in the earliest stages of their career in the most fertile creative parts of their career are stuck in very junior positions. Um, a full professor, a full principal investigator, you often don't reach that stage until well into your 40s. So um, Dr. Leonardi is probably at probably the most productive point in his career, in many careers, in different in many fields. If he was in, let's say, the tech startup industry, he would have probably be heading a, a, a giant startup by now, or a very successful company by now. And he comes from a world of in research which is uh, bustling with activity. Um, programmable T-cells, CAR T-cells, these are a promising therapy for for cancers that are being developed now. If I had to think in what, in my 15 years since I graduated from medical school, what field has changed the most in, in that time, which is almost unrecognizable from what I learned in medical school, it's got to be oncology and cancer treatment. And that, that's the field that Dr. Leonardi comes from. So I would, you know, listen to what he has to say, uh, listen to what this review says. Um, the attacks and, and criticism I see are usually of the ad hominem nature, um, trying to attack credibility. I would rather that people uh, try to address the specific concerns that, uh, that Dr. Leonardi brings up uh, and try to address it from a scientific basis rather than attacking qualifications. And that's from my perspective as an emergency doctor. Um, so the fact is immunology is quite complex. Um, you have signals upon signals that activate, deactivate, modulate. It's, it's really, honestly, it's been a headache trying to figure all of this out. It reminds me of the Onion headline, you know, of the fake um, news story from World War, II, um, World War I, where, you know, different countries are attacking each other. It's such, it's such a huge mess just to try to contemplate all of this. Um, the, and then we'll go over, this is the main paper that Dr. Leonardi wrote. Um, going through it is quite dense, and we're going to go over some of the main concepts that he brings up. Um, but what he points to, dysfunction in the immune system, he talked about from a theoretical basis um, a year and a half ago, is now, just in the last um, few weeks, has been verified in the lab. This is why um, you know there's been a lot of excitement in this area, is that a theoretical problem that Dr. Leonardi identified back then is being verified in wet lab research now. And the problem is, is that you have, you know, people are basing their um, return to school, return to work plans, expecting that, you know, T-cells will come to our rescue. You know, when you have journalists in the Wall Street Journal and other conservative papers saying that, you know, uh, talking about T-cells, a complex topic that, you know, even me, like as, as, a, as a physician, as someone who has lab experience in the past, can barely understand, then you have a problem. And this has become a political issue in a way. And you have people trying to discount any criticism of this, mostly for political reasons. So just to, uh, let's, we're going to go over a review of the different layers of your immune system. Um, this is from, a, this figure is from a great uh, channel if you're looking to learn about this stuff, Animated Biology with Arpan. Um, so the first line um, is your innate immune system. These are cells that recognize on contact that something doesn't belong and kills them on sight. Um, these are like your automated sentries. Uh, then you have cells that bring pieces of, uh, of invaders to more complicated cells like T cells and B cells that develop an adaptive response. And you have organs throughout your body that are involved in your immune system. These are your, your immune uh, organs. But what happens, and we'll go over this in more detail, is that uh, the virus SARS-CoV-2 systematically disables your immune system. It disables your connecting players. And it hampers your B cell response, leaving only your T cells to act. And when they act, they act over exuberantly. They act too far. They go too far. And then they mediate a lot of the damage that you're seeing in severe cases. So this is a figure, um, another thing that can probably give you a headache, but this is just a map of, of what uh, your uh, immune cells look like. So leukocytes, those are basically white blood cells. They branch off into different families. Um, the myeloid cells, these are the cells that, um, you know, are part of your in, innate immune system that we talked about. Um, these are the lymphoid cells, lymphocytes. So these branch off into, most importantly, B cells. These are the cells that produce your antibodies. T cells, these are the cells that 
uh, help produce antibodies or kill infected cells. I often find myself going back to this figure because all of these immunology papers have, you know, markers and receptors that mark what these cells do and what they react to. So when you see an immunology paper, I would go to this website, uh, Cell Signal, and use this as kind of a legend to figure out, um, you know, what they're talking about, if you want to go back. This is kind of like the periodic table of, um, of immunology, of, of, of white blood cells. So this is a good figure to remember. So the core of your adaptive immune system, so we go back to innate immune system and then adaptive immune system. This is the part of your body that adapts and remembers pathogens. The core of it is the work between these three types of cells. Um, helper T cells, which are a type of T cell here. Cytotoxic T cells, which are also in the chart here and B cells, which um, are here, which make your antibodies. And sort of the working relationship between these three cells are and sort of the balance between them and the order in which they're activated are what produce an effective immune response against an invader. And when, they're, when that order is disrupted, then you have the problems that we see with SARS-CoV-2. So just to review, your B cells are your antibody factories. Um, they are presented a, um, a foreign object by your helper T cells. That's your CD4 helper T cells. The, um, the B cells uh, get activated and they become antibody producing factories. Some of them go on to become memory B cells so that when you get attacked by the same pathogen, they can come back and sort of remember um, and produce antibodies again. So these are this is another different type of figure that shows your um, your B cells, uh, also called um, plasma blasts, are producing antibodies. Some of them get to go on to live in your lymph node or your spleen, where they'll wait for the next time you get attacked by something. And you know, some of the more you know really privileged ones get invited to live in the bone marrow, where they stay for your whole lifetime and produce um, antibodies against things that that might uh, attack you. So, for instance, I got uh, a measles vaccination. Um, when I was a child, I got exposed to a real-life measles case about 10 years ago. Um, I didn't get infected, even though it's it's one of the most infective viruses out there next to COVID-19. Um, because, you know, my I have memory B cells, plasma blasts, living in my bone marrow, ready to produce antibodies. And I always have a low level of, of antibodies ready to attack um, any measles virus that comes across. So that's how that works. And this is another figure taken from Animated Biology with Arpan. But basically, this is what happens when your body sees, um, remembers and sees something. It, um, it produces and rapidly uh, expands the number of B cells producing antibodies. Antibodies come out by the billions, um, attaches onto whatever the pathogen, pathogen is, and helps um, the rest of your immune system kill off um, those cells in that pathogen. The problem is, is that this response takes about three days to ramp up. Um, so it, um, it will defend you in many cases. It will, it will save you, but it takes time for that, for your cells to sort of kick into gear. Um, and this is just a figure showing what happens when you get a vaccine. So you get uh, the mRNA sequence. It produces that spike protein your immune cells sort of get primed and your B cells get primed to make antibodies to that spike protein. Your memory cells go off and, and live in your lymph nodes. We're not sure if they live in your bone marrow yet. Um, and then when you get attacked by uh, SARS-CoV-2, the B cells quickly assemble. They start uh, proliferating. They start cloning and, rap and replicating. And they produce you know billions of antibodies that attach to the virus and stop it from attacking you, ideally. And what happens without vaccine? Um, the virus takes over your cells, produces millions and trillions of copies of itself, um, and then it goes on to infect all your organs, causing all the different problems that we've been seeing in, in hospitals, ICUs, and especially, you know, the long COVID syndrome as well. So in summary, the problem, you know, we've gone over B cells. The problem is the antibodies take two to three days to ramp up, which we'll go over is too long and that allows the virus to run wreak havoc in your body. But the antibodies do, do ramp up after, though. So we'll go over T cells. 
So these are kind of your helpers and assassins. So this life cycle is basically um, when you're when you're a baby, um, your body trains uh, trains your T cells, these white cells, to recognize not to kill yourself, but to attack other pathogens. Um, that's a, you don't produce um, new uh, naive. They're called naive T cells. You don't produce new ones after about a certain age. Usually. It stops by your teenage years, but completely stops after 40. So you sort of have a fixed pool of these naive cells. Um, this is from that figure we were going over before. Uh, different signals trigger your, your T cells to differentiate, to become the two types, the cytotoxic and, T, and the, the helper T cells. Um, the cytotoxic cells, the CD8 cells, these are like your assassin cells. They find these, um, these cells that are taken over by virus and it kills them. Um, the helper T cells, like we mentioned before, are the ones that present um, foreign antibody antigens to your B cells to produce, you know, millions of antibodies. So, so they're very important and they're part of that ballet that goes together to to get your proper immune response. Now, the T cells have a life cycle. So, as I mentioned before, you have naive T cells. These are produced when you were a baby. You have a pool of them in your body. They'll they'll clone, they'll replicate to maintain numbers, but that ratio changes over time and reduces as you get older. Um, when a naive T cell, when you're um, fighting off a um, a bug of some kind, that naive T cell binds and becomes a um, becomes activated, and it becomes an effector uh, T cell. So an effector T cell is like a fully grown assassin T cell, ready to kill whatever whatever bug it was presented with and it stays with you for the rest of your life these cells stay in your lymph nodes it's all over and in different parts of your body waiting for that same bug it's like married to that that bug it's just waiting for it to come again so that it can kill it um, so over time as you get older your your naive t-cells pair off with different bugs that you're exposed to and then the ratio um, falls in your in your blood in your lymph nodes in your spleen lungs that, that pool ready to um, uh, attack and, and learn to attack new problems uh, reduces with time. Um, so that, that's, some, that's an important thing that we'll go over as well. And the way these T cells kill is a very coordinated um, a system where it uses signaling. So remember that, that figure where we saw all those numbers and crazy numbers? Those are different signals used between different cells to signal to each other what to do. Um, the T cell sends a signal called um, CD95, um, which triggers the um, the cell to to die. Apoptosis means um, cell death. This is like it killing. Uh, this is a figure of it killing a cancer cell. It's a coordinated activity. It's kind of like you know when you're in a in those movies where they're coordinating a launch of a nuclear missile. You have to sort of everything has to sort of go in the right sequence, and you turn things, and then you kill off kill off this cell that you don't want. So in this case, it's a cancer cell. Um, in um, you know fighting viruses, it's killing infected um, you know cells that are infected with uh, with the virus. And this is a bit this gets a bit technical, but you might want to come back to this later. So I'll go over the process that Dr. Leonardi mentioned in this paper. So you have a pool of your T cells, um, including a lot of naive T cells. You're exposed to the spike protein of of SARS-CoV-2. Um, this uh, causes a lot of stimulation of your T cells, especially because there's something called a super antigen on it, which we'll go over shortly. These chemicals in your, um, uh, the, these signals sort of act on it and cause them to activate even further. Um, and then you end up with massive T cell activation. All of these naive cells have become fully differentiated, um, you know, t uh, effector T cells. And they show signals that they're they have exhaustion markers called PD one um, uh, and uh, STIM three. They're also showing uh, signs of granzyme and porphyrin. These are uh, chemicals used by cells to kill other cells, by your T cells to kill other cells. So all of this together um, causes, and you don't you know if this is if this is going above your head, it did for me too. But I just have to have read it 10, 20 times, you know, read the papers as well. It'll eventually make some sense. Well, all of this together, what you need to know is that all of this activity, the massive activation of too many T cells, all of this stuff happening where, you know, apoptosis is happening, exhaustion is happening, 
It, re it results in a massive inflammation from cytokine release. These are chemicals that lead to inflammation and apoptosis and death of cells. So this is the cascade that leads to you know, damage in your lungs, damage all over your body in severe um, COVID-19 infection. And again, like as we mentioned, there is that life cycle of, of the T-cells. With all that activation happening, your pool of naive T-cells comes down and the age of your immune system goes up because it's prematurely aged. And that's being found by immunologists who study aging in, in your immune system. And so this, um, this is something that's being seen in the real world. And, and again, like, you know, we're seeing in papers published very recently um, that T cell apoptosis, the death of T cells related to um, CD95 and those chemicals we were talking about is seen in severe um, COVID-19 cases. And the implications of that are not good. Um, this is a, a tweet coming, um, you know, showing that if you don't have as many T cells, um, naive T cells to fight new pathogens, you don't have as many to fight off, you know, when cancer cells come your way, uh, let's say. It also, you don't have them ready to fight off reactivation of viruses that are living inside you, such as um, latent uh, mono or Epstein-Barr virus. So those are some of the implications that, um, that we're facing with, with this problem. So the, to summarize, you know, the problem with, with T cells is that you deplete your naive T cells and you activate too many T cells at once causing severe damage. Another big problem is that um, SARS-CoV-2 blocks your early immune response. So that's that innate immunity we were talking about before. Um, it has a lot of tricks up its sleeve that it basically disables your, your alarm system in your body. Um, it basically inhibits um, something called type 1 interferon and leads you instead to create, to release uh, inflammatory markers, uh, chemicals like interleukin 1b, uh, 1 beta here. And what is interferon? Um, basically, interferon are chemicals that interfere with viruses. That's why they got the name. Um, and this is an important signal. It's like your car alarm, your home, uh, your home security alarm. Your, your the virus basically has a number of tricks up its sleeve that disables this whole system. And then all that signaling that triggers your adaptive immune system, all of these connecting players and stuff are disabled. And so your adaptive immune system does not get wind of what's coming its way. Everything gets slowed down and things go out of balance. And we see this, like this is a paper showing that in, in people who had a poor interferon response, their mortality rate was incredible uh, compared to people who had a normal response. So it's being seen in the real world. Um, and, and it looks like uh, the conclusion in the immunology world is that whether your interferon response gets activated is probably the greatest determinant of whether you get severe or mild COVID-19. It seems like one of the um, major determinants of what's going to happen to you and uh, where you're going to end up, basically. Another wrinkle is that um, the virus it disables another part of your innate immunity in which your body takes chunks of, uh, of the invader and shows it to your immune system to trigger the adaptive immune system. So it, the ORF protein, open reading frame 8 protein in SARS-CoV-2, um, has a system in which it degrades um, uh, the, uh, the compound that presents uh, these antigens to your cells and presents your, prevents your adaptive immune system from acting. So this is how um, just an animation showing your cell has uh, some viral antigens inside. Antigen is a bit of a foreign protein. Um, it presents it outside on that MHC1 complex. Your T cells um, take a look at it. That uh, these are the um, the basically your um, CD8 T cells, and this would trigger normally that CD8 cell to kill this infected cell. But this, as we saw, your this virus prevents this from presenting it to your CD8 cell. And so that cell lives on and goes on to produce millions of viral copies and, and, and does all the damage that it does. This is also from a great channel called Emboss. Highly recommended if you want to learn some of this stuff. Um, there's a lot of great articles by Dr. Uh, William Hesseltine, um, a Harvard scientist um, who has an 18-part series um, on the exact mechanisms of how 
um, Omicron and other um, uh, COVID variants evade your innate immunity. Worth completely worth reading. So the bottom line is that um, the virus takes over your cells to make millions of copies. It stops your interferon signaling. Uh, it disrupts, you know, signaling and adaptive immunity. Presents your CD8 cells from killing infected cells, and you know the end result is that you have billions and trillions of viral particles in your blood and your body. And that that delicate balance between those three main components we were talking about is is disrupted. Um, and then what happens is that you have a spike in your viral load, but you don't have any immune response. And then that that your body basically goes crazy. Your T cells go crazy trying to make up for it. And the problem is is that um, and it, like we mentioned before, it takes you know a few days for your antibodies to respond. What you do have, though, is the antibodies circulating from your most recent infection, your most, um, you know, your most recent vaccine, let's say. Um, th those are circulating and staying high in your blood for, you know, three to four months after your, your, your vaccination. They're kind of like, if you watch the original Top Gun movie, kind of like your combat air patrol. Like every, every aircraft carrier air group has, you know, a few fighters in the air ready for any unexpected threat waiting to come. And so these are always standing by ready to go. You know, some Russian MiGs are heading your way. Um, you have your combat air patrol ready to defend, uh, you know, defend your aircraft carrier. And that's what your circulating antibodies are. And, um, you know, your circulating antibodies may be at a level enough if um, they secure space in your, in your lymph node, spleen, or your bone marrow that are high enough to, present, uh, to stop a virus. It doesn't seem to be the case, though, with, with COVID-19 yet. We're not sustaining long-term high-level antibodies to prevent uh, infection from getting established. So what is the end result? Your innate immunity is knocked out. The first line is knocked out. Um, that prevents, you know, your B cells from being activated. Um, there's a bunch of things that are uh, overactivating your T cells. So what happens? Your, your virus is replicating without control. Um, parts of your immune system are knocked out. Your T cells basically go crazy. Um, <clears throat> and like we mentioned before, you know, apoptosis happens, inflammation happens. Um, there's, you know, you see that scarcity of naive T cells um, as well. Um, and then you have um, severe damage to bodies. And this is from an autopsy series. And that in the sickest patients, you had an abundance of activated, exhausted uh, C, uh, cytotoxic T cells. And you know this is not uh, this is something that's being noticed by immunologists around the world. This is from our, um, a lecture given at the University of Helsinki by an immunologist who's um, also investigating uh, the role of T cells in in damage um, in SARS-CoV-2. So this is something that's being noticed across the immunology world. So back to what we were talking about before. Um, w there's something we talked about on the virus's spike protein called a super antigen. Um, what is that exactly? It sounds like a superhero. It is kind of, it, but except it's uh, it's super at basically at killing your immune system. So, this is those uh, immune cells that present, um, you know, foreign um, objects to your immune your T cells. This uh, super antigen is designed in a way that it overactivates too many of your T cells at the same time and driving a lot more inflammation. So normally, a tiny fraction of your naive T cells are used to fight off an, any one infection. What a super antigen does, it activates way too many of your uh, T cells, and it's kind of a strategy to, uh, to hide amongst the chaos in your immune system that results. So instead of activating you know, 0.001% of your naive T cells, it activates 20% of them, you know, 10,000, 100,000 times more than it should. Um, then the result is huge inflammation. The cytokine storm, um, all the different inflammatory problems we've seen with COVID-19. And this was first um, described um, from a computational biology lab. Um, and I think it, what, um, it's kind of um, a touchy topic, apparently, because, you know, you have um, sort of an insert, a PRRAR insert in the uh, spike protein, which, you know, could point to, you know, um, this could be artificially inserted or not. So it's a touchy issue amongst virologists, which is why I don't think it's talked about as much and it's controversial. But what's interesting is that you have um, 
a monoclonal antibody against the superantigen is actually effective at, at um, stopping severe uh, COVID-19. So that shows you that the uh, superantigen and superantigenic activation of your immune system is a big component in, uh, in severe COVID-19. And this is an example, this is a figure that shows it. Um, you have the spike protein, um, it's cleaved and you have that superantigen-like region. And in this paper, they're discussing how its role in causing hyperinflammation in MIC, which is the condition that of hyperinflammation in children. And this was covered in a, an excellent episode of uh, this, this Week in Virology. Um, highly recommended viewing. And these are superantigens, um, different other superantigens in the... Um, uh, one caused by, um, two of them caused by staphylococcal enterotoxin and one for toxic shock. If you, uh, these are syndromes that we see occasionally in, in clinical medicine and um, the patients can be quite severely ill with them. And it also implicated in uh, the lymphocollapse seen in Ebola virus and also um, implicated in uh, the uh, damage done in um, Epstein-Barr uh, and multiple sclerosis. So the theory is that the, uh, the virus causes activation of a an human endogenous retrovirus, which has a superantigen of its own, um, which causes you know damage and all the plaques that you see in MS. Interestingly enough, there was a paper that implicated another human endogenous retrovirus reactivation in for COVID-19 as well. So another interesting point, so Dr. Leonardi is about to have a paper published that will go in more detail on this, is that you know, why is there such an age-related component with severe COVID-19? Um, it seems that um, naive T-cells and that ratio in your blood and your body help suppress the overactivation of your T-cells. So we went over this. This is your T-cell life cycle. Uh, these are your naive T-cells, the ones we talked about that are made when you, were, when you were a child, and that they differentiate to become your effector, your assassin T-cells, and, and they terminally differentiate and uh, that ratio goes down over time. So if you liken um, your ratio of naive T-cells to, you know, a nuclear fission, let's say, um, you have, you know, if you have that uncontrolled reaction of that cytokine activation where you have all those signals we talked about, you know, CD95, AKT, uh, you know, the superantigen triggering um, overactivation of T-cells, how do you stop overactivation of uranium how do you why why hasn't our nuclear reactors caused giant craters in the ground you have moderation in that reaction so you have carbon or graphite moderators that slow down fast neutrons and and you know bring the reaction down to a stable state where you can produce heat but not cause an uncontrolled chain reaction similarly and this was a figure that dr leonardi was kind enough to share for his upcoming paper the, his theory is that the, um, the naive T cells themselves act as a sink on these overactivation signals, on the CD95 signals and other signals, and that the ratio of them that you have in your blood uh, prevents um, this overactivation that we talked about in your T cells. And that's why, you know, above, you know, below 50, 60, um, if, if the virus gets through your vaccines, through your immune system, even if it activates uh, your T cells, it won't be as bad as it would be in someone who's older because you have all those naive T cells to act as a sink. But then the problem is you will deplete those cells and then the next time you get it, it might not be as good, which is another topic that Dr. Leonardi goes over. So this is, this is a figure that demonstrates that, is that you have a gradual reduction in your, in your ratio of naive T cells, but you know, your mortality, especially after 60, goes up exponentially. And these are some other theories on why this might be by other immunologists. Um, one theory is that, you know, just the ratio of memory T cells is uh, what contributes to massive cytokine uh, release. Another theory is that, um, you know, the immune system in children just knows where to allocate energy better for this kind of thing. So it's all fascinating stuff. But overall, the general theme is that there is something going on with T cells. There's T cell overactivation, there's T cell depletion, and the immunology world is starting to agree on this. So let's get this down to the basic points. Why are our vaccines not lasting longer? Why are we needing, why did we need boosters for Omicron? And this is verified by, you know, um, recent reports um, that the CDC made to the White House and published recently where you saw, you know, protection of the mRNA vaccines for, against hospitalization 
went down um, more than six months after dose two and went right back up after the third dose. And the, and the UK also reported the same. You have um, a significant drop in mortality benefit went right up after after the um, the booster. And this this paper from Singapore was very interesting in which they studied breakthrough infections and their close contacts. And what they found was that, you know, the T-cell profiles were very similar between the two groups, but the group that had the lower, uh, lower B-cells, lower antibody-producing cells, got the breakthrough infections. And whereas those with anti higher antibody levels did fine, they didn't get infected. And so it looks like the conclusion is that it is antibodies that are driving protection. Um, it is having that antibody response, that combat air patrol, ready to pounce on any virus coming its way that is definitive in preventing um, that cascade of illness. And this is another paper showing that decline in antibodies three to four months after, after um, your um, second vaccination. So again, we come back to this balance is that without the antibodies to coordinate this response, all, everything rests on the T cells and the imbalance is what causes severe disease. So to summarize, so antibody protection from vaccines and infection may only last about three to four months as antibodies naturally wane with time. Maybe a high level antibody response may develop a, a long-term response, but it seems to have not have happened yet. Maybe it'll happen after the boosted doses that we gave just uh, during the Omicron wave. Uh, the other thing is T cell immunity cannot be counted on. Um, it seems they're a double edged sword and they can harm as much as help and the effect seems to get worse as you get older. Um, the other issue is repeated uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection may lead to loss of naive T cells and premature aging of the immune system with all kinds of other downstream effects on cancer prevention and preventing opportunistic infections and all kinds of other problems. And the other issue, um, the other thing that we hope and it's likely from studies that we've seen on long COVID is that vaccination may protect from the worst of these effects, especially when infection is prevented. So, you know, what are the implications if we don't act on any of this information? So we're already seeing, you know, studies in, um, you know, people with long-term COVID are seeing, you know, you know brain issues that are consistent, like similar to, you know, Alzheimer's or Lewy body disease. You know, you're seeing, you know, this was an excellent paper in Nature just a few weeks ago showing long-term persistent uh, immune, um, you know, uh, white cell issues, like lymphocyte problems, and they're, off, they're a pretty good marker for long COVID syndrome. So aberrant immune activation lasting, you know, eight months or more after, after infection. Another excellent paper showed that, you know, the increase, um, there was a massive increase in cardiovascular incidence after COVID infection. Um, you know, I think the rate was something like one in 200 um, um, will have a cardiac event a year after, after your COVID infection. And then this figure shows, you know, you have overactivation of, of T cells all over um, uh, your uh, pulmonary system. And this is an, an astonishing number. This is in my province of Ontario. You know, in the last um, two months, um, one out of every 100 person above 70 died of COVID-19 who was unvaccinated. Um, it just shows you like the age preponderance just hits it home. We already knew this, you know, and definitely the rate is smaller with, uh, with vaccination. But in my province, every, every um, person at that age has got a booster fairly early, like um, November, December, and are all, all um, soon to be eligible for fourth, fourth doses. So, Vaccination seems to be holding the line, but the unvaccinated are just getting slaughtered, and, and we know why now. So predictions. Um, so an uncoordinated immune response, unguided by innate and antibody immunity, we saw those being scrambled, will cause abnormal and excessive T-cell activation. T-cells will cause inflammation and damage to tissues throughout the body, especially if your naive T-cells are low. And a grim future awaits adults above 60 who will be in a permanent state of risk from COVID unless they've had a booster in the last four months. Um, unless, of course, um, there's a persistent and strong antibody response that stays permanently high in the blood. Hopefully that happens eventually after, you know, how many, after whatever number of boosters it takes. Younger people may not get the severe disease as much, but they could get a T-cell-initiated long COVID syndrome, which they may face with every infection. 
So these are these are some grim predictions, but I think backed up by the science that we've seen so far. So what is the solution? You know, there's a lot to be to despair, but you know there are solutions on the horizon, and this is not something to give up on. Um, you know, I'd say we should keep boosting until we don't need to. Um, this was a great podcast, also from the Microbe TV team, uh, Immune Episode 52, where they interviewed a B cell immunologist. So additional boosters seem to strengthen, you know, your B cell germinal centers. That's in your lymph nodes. It broadens your antibody response. It harnesses unused memory cells. It could lead to long-lasting memory B cells in your bone marrow. So that's what I would do. Like if I had elderly relatives, um, myself, like I will keep boosting every three to four months until a better solution comes along. And that better solution, uh, you know, maintain balance in your immune system as long as you can. And, you know, try to aim for that long-lived you know, spleen, lymph node, bone marrow immunity from your from your antibody producing B cells. And stay under that that vaccine antibody shield as much as you can. You know, keep your your antibody levels high as long as possible and prevent you from getting through that cascade of, of T cell activation. But really the solution to wait for is gonna be the intranasal vaccines. This is a great paper from Dr. Iwasaki in um in which she uh, shows a intranasal vaccine, which, you know, tries to get the cells where your your the virus first attacks you, and tries to recruit them, and it's it produces long lasting immunity when combined with a, a standard intramuscular vaccine. This was a, a recent paper published from from my uh, from my university, McMaster University, where they tested a intranasal vaccine. And one thing it did was very interesting. It actually trained your innate immunity. It trained all the tissues in your lungs, in your nose, in your mouth. And that produced um, you know, long-lasting immunity. It lowered the viral burden, viral dissemination in other tissues, clinical disease. So this is something really promising. We, we discussed how you know, the virus disables your innate immunity, but with an intranasal vaccine, it trains your innate immunity to prevent from being disabled. And same thing, it goes it goes over the lining of your lungs and your throat and your mouth and does the same thing. So this this really is the future, and, and hopefully it's not very far away. But we do have a pathway. You you keep boosting until until we get to here, and this is hopefully is not far away. So until then, I you know I would recommend, and I think most physicians would re- recommend, given this information, that you minimize the number of times you get infected. You know, use rapid tests as much as possible. You know, ventilation upgrades and HEPA filters should be basic common sense now. And regular boosting as well. That's probably a good idea. Use N95 or equivalent masks in crowded indoor spaces. And there really needs to be a coordinated campaign to vaccinate the world. Um, there's 3 billion people who have not received a single dose of vaccine. All of these people are, are variant factories until, until we can get them protected. And really, you know... We need to understand that there's going to be surges and and uh, ends of surges of this of this virus, you know. Buckle down when things get really bad. But you know, in uh, most of the world, we're sort of coming off the Omicron phase, so we're coming at a time when, you know, we can relax and try to recharge our batteries. But really, you know, maintain the equipment and the and the sort of posture to go back to it in case another variant comes until we have the better solution of the better vaccines and intranasal vaccines. And really until then, um, this is an approach that, um, you know, I'm using personally is that, you know, try and try to maintain safe, common spaces, your workplace, schools, places of worship, try to make sure these places are well ventilated. Um, I personally would wear an N95 mask in these places until disease incidence is very low. If you have, um, you know, high risk um, people in your family, um, and you have, you know, people in your family who are engaging in high risk activities, you know, try to gate access with rapid tests, maybe some cooling off time as well. So we'll have to learn to adapt to, to do the new way of living. We don't all have the same risks to SARS-CoV-2. It's especially going to hit unvaccinated people like children under five, adults over 60 who are still at risk, and even young people who are at risk of long COVID. This is something you want to get as few times as possible. So use every strategy at your disposal. Um, lobby for these changes as much as you can. I fear that across um, the Western world, there's this there's this um, temptation to declare victory early. 
and the science is telling us otherwise. Um, it's unfortunate that the urge is there, the political ex uh, imperative is there to declare mission accomplished. I'm, you know, I was dismayed to learn that a lot of the decision making in a lot of US states to lift la mask mandates was based on focus group research rather than professional or scientific opinion. Um, it's very unfortunate that's happening. None of that, you know, our feelings don't change the way in which this virus behaves. Um, you know, that should be plain to us by now. We're all sick of it, but you know, there's still hard work ahead and we have, we know the path ahead to, to beat this thing. So without further ado, um, we're going to go on to the, to the interview with Dr. Leonardi. Um, the t title is the T cells are not all right. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, we will have further interviews covering other important topics in this pandemic. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Leonardi, for joining us. Um, why don't you tell us about um, your qualifications and your uh, research background? Thanks for having me, Dr. Perzada. Um, so my uh, research background first was... Um, I always liked uh, cancer immunotherapy, especially of melanoma, because I was a lifeguard and a water polo player growing up. So um, first as an undergrad, I went to Johns Hopkins, and uh, then I went back to Johns Hopkins for a master's program. And after the first year of being graduated for my undergrad, um, I applied for a spot in um, the surgery branch of the National Cancer Institute uh, that, that was using T cell immunotherapies to treat cancers, notably uh, melanoma, um, you know, and that's what I always wanted to get into was melanoma immunotherapy. Um, so while I was there, um, I was doing my master's and um, I worked on some problems. Uh, we, we saw a few things where uh, T cells were uh, behaving in an interesting way. And um, so I, uh, I worked on that. I found the answer as to why they were behaving that way. And I worked on that issue um, as a fellow. And I was there for a total of four years uh, while, I, while I made a couple of publications on that, on that issue. And the issue was namely T cell differentiation and interactions and cytotoxic function. And that basically means how T cells grow up and how they work and how they kind of communicate with each other. Um, so based on that work, um, I, I did a PhD uh, in conjunction with the National Cancer Institute and with Kingston University of London. Um, I also was in medical school. Um, I went to medical school for two years and I went back out to, to finish the PhD and publish more with the same group. And then I went back into medical school. Um, so I am, um, I, I, I am a final year medical student but um, right now uh, I've taken off because of, um, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate what's going on. And, and I felt like um, I, would, I would maybe go into public health a bit instead of um, focusing on just medicine right now because of what's happening. Uh, so I do have a lot of admiration for the people that are in the front lines, on the front lines, such as yourself, um, but that's my background. So it's basically four years of cancer immunotherapy uh, culminating in PhD. I haven't done a postdoc yet, and I'm I am a final year medical student. Oh wow! So um, maybe you'll help join us in emergency medicine one day. <laughs> yeah, um, that'd be one thing is we've seen a lot of virologists speaking publicly, like you know Dr. Rackenyello, uh, Dr. Rasmussen, Dr. Peter Hotez, uh, but not many immunologists like yourself uh, or like Dr. Uh, Iwasaki. Um, what, what do you think is missing from the conversation without having the voice of immunologists versus the virologists? I think the issue is uh, the dynamic of the immune system. So um, if we, the first thing that we heard a lot from the virology side was how the SARS, it would, it would namely be a one and done. Okay, and that was a big assumption. So unfortunately, when that assumption broke and when it proved wrong, now we have the whole dynamics of immune system aging, and it is not good news necessarily. So I think a lot of immunologists may be quiet right now because they don't wanna discuss the implications of being constantly reinfected with this virus, especially considering the physiology um, that it creates, like the pathophysiology, 
like the autoantibodies and the um, the migration of cells in the places of T cells in the places where they're not supposed to be. So this is all pretty much bad news. And nobody wants nobody wants bad news on the on the news. And so it's not necessarily platformed. It's all good news only. And here's another thing. There's a uh, there's another thing that they everybody is speaking in terms of averages. Well, the older people, the older populations. And the populations with um, immune problems or deficiencies, those people are going to be sort of marginalized. So if we speak of averages, well, sure, the second infection might not be as severe, but if you're if you're 60 years old, 70 years old, if you're getting up there, there there are reasons why, and we'll get into this, why a second infection could be more severe. You know, as is with other infections like the flu. When you're 80 years old, you've been exposed to influenzas before, okay? You'll have cross-reactive T-cell immunity. The problem is um, it, it, you, you will still have a, a level of severe disease. It's not, it's not certain that it will be a mild course. And so many, many older people succumb to the flu. And um, given the fantastic amount of uh, immune aging and immune pathophysiology that SARS-CoV-2 does, we may see some some sort of the same things, but even more accelerated. That is definitely not good news. Um, I saw your paper um, from last year, the ACT FAST um, and T-cell paper. Um, could you describe, you know, what, uh, maybe we'll get into the weeds here, like what is happening, what the T-cells do, they differentiate, there's CD4, there's CD8 tests, people, uh, t cells, people who've treated HIV know those numbers, but how does that process work? And maybe you can describe it and we'll try to, you know, animate it hopefully. Okay, great. So when these T cells encounter their uh, specific, the peptides that they recognize, okay, all T cells, they're, they're almost like born with a specificity. They have a T cell receptor, a TCR, that recognizes a specific peptide sequence um, that's either presented by MHC class one or MHC class two. Class one, if it's a CD8 T cell, class two, if it's a CD4 T cell. Okay, so um, professional um, antigen pre presenting cells will present um, fragments, these protein fragments that are peptides to uh, cells out just out in the periphery or of the cell, basically on the surface of the cell, they'll be presenting it. And they'll say, okay, this is MHC1. This is what's inside me, okay? This is basically what I have inside me. MHC2, this is what is I've found, I've picked it up from the outside. So this is outside somewhere. So, um, so what we consider uh, CD8 T cells, CD8 T cells that recognize MHC1, uh, those are gonna be the ones that are reacting to in things like infections directly. So an infected cell will present MHC on MHC1 peptides of what's inside it. And that's where you'll get like um, the peptide sequences that are specific to the virus, to a virus. And those CD8 T cells will react and then kill that infected cell. So um, my, the, uh, the, the paper that I published, um, I noticed that naive T cells were correlated, strongly correlated um, in what could be a causal fashion to mild disease. Now there's a number of reasons that could be, and we could theorize why, but I know from experience in my own work that naive T cells um, actually present, prevent exuberant function of very highly differentiated T cells. And so T cells, when we talk about T cell differentiation, they have this um, life cycle. It's not really a cycle, it's actually a one-way street, really. I mean, there's, there's some publications by uh, a, uh, a scientist named Rafi Ahmed, and he says sometimes they can go back from effectors to memory, and he, he kind of shows it. But namely, and generally, what we see is the T cell will go from a naive state, where, which means naive, it's never encountered, encountered that specific peptide that it's specific to. The naive, um, uh, naive cells you're, you're born with, um, you grow, it grows in your thymus, I guess, right? Yeah, and, that's right. And the thymus disappears when you're about two years old or so. Yeah, so there are implications uh, of that, basically. So 
um, as you age, you know, your thymus starts to what they call involute. So you stop actually educating and making these these T cells that are specific to things like viruses and cancers. So you have a it's fixed just, supply, basically. You, you have huh? a fixed supply. Like you have a fixed yeah, supply. Unfortunately, well, well so um, it's kind of a fixed supply. I mean, the, the thing is the T cells can grow in number and contract in population size. But when you're older, you, you stop this generation of T cells. And when the thymus involutes, like it's uh, greatly hampered. Um, so yeah, so it just, it's kind of like, um, I mean, I hate to, I hate to be callous about it, but it's almost like uh, a built in obsolescence planned obsolescence for us, like our immune systems, for some reason, we just stop generating these T cells, it could be very important. I mean, all, all our cell types, even stem cells can end up aging. And this is along with that. And there are actually stem cell uh, T cell stem cells as well. And those, um, they're self renewing like other stem cells, but they can also be pushed to age. And that's actually my work was looking at how that how that stem cell is uh, ages and how it's pushed to age and I I found out how to control it in a way you know how to prevent that from happening um, so so this so a few publications showed that naive T cells are preventing uh, exuberant function of of uh, highly um, highly cytotoxic CD8 T cells uh, that was my work so I I, I noticed that um, they, they were correlated with mild disease in SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I knew like a theoretical mechanism for why that could be, because basically the naive T cells are preventing the exuberant function of the um, highly differentiated and cytotoxic T cells. So I, you know, in the publication, I, the title was a little bit of a pun, you know, act fast. I, it was just to be um, interesting, you know, and playful because Here's why, because the, the two uh, steps in that pathway of, of differentiation to finally achieving cytotoxic function, on the surface of the cell, you have a receptor called CD95 uh, is the marker, and it's a receptor called FAS, okay? So when that receptor is engaged, um, it sends, um, when the cell is not a terminally differentiated cell, engagement of that CD95 receptor sends an aging signal into the cell for it to differentiate. And then that differentiation signal is actually specifically carried through uh, AKT. AKT is the, um, is the signaling protein that carries that uh, signal. So, um, so basically my rationale in the publication, really I wanted to get out, I kind of wanted to get out a warning about what serial reinfections could do, you know, to, to age uh, the T cell repertoire, the, the population of T cells. I wanted to get that out there. I also wanted to include the uh, mechanism of that aging of, uh, you know, CD95 mediated differentiation, AKT mediated differentiation. So the thing is, you know, a one and done of, of a SARS-CoV-2 infection. I mean, physiologically, it looks like, you know, it does age it does age our immune system. It pushes the differentiation. We see that there was an MDPI article about um, that looked at telomeres and in, in aging uh, after infection. Um, and there's also there's also data about the different uh, the pushed different differentiation of T cells after infection. Um, so if it was a one and done, I mean that it would be a hit, and then you'd take it, and and maybe you'd um, physiologically just adapt. But given, given reinfections, we're going to be continually pushing this system of differentiation in our T cells. Now, I didn't know entirely what, I, I, only, saw, I only saw that the T cells were actually, they were they'd taken a hit, you know, they were pushed in differentiation. And um, I didn't know exactly what was doing that, but we did see uh, published by um, Arditi and everybody else, uh, that one paper that found a super antigen on spike. And that, that made sense to me because it was pushing the, the T cells pretty hard. And um, I think when, you, when, you, uh, when, you, when you're able to load a lot of super antigen, then you'll be able to stimulate the T cells pretty hard. Um, there's also a new, a new paper, it's, it's not peer reviewed yet, 
uh, that's claiming that ORF8 is also um, a super antigen as well, has some super antigenic function. We'll see about that. The, the evidence is low. It's all, it looks like it's all in silica, in silico. Um, and now a recent paper came out of Germany that's saying that complement is um, activating and pushing the T cells into high cytotoxic function. Now that, yeah, that paper that I described um, where I described the differentiation and what happens with cytotoxic function when you stimulate all these T cells and they interact and there's not a lot of naive T cells around. Um, I did say that you could either block CD95 or inhibit the T cell um, effector differentiation with an AKT inhibitor. Um, but I also, I also wanted to note that after infection, there's a reduction in the naive T cells and the amount of, or proportion of naive T cells that are seen circulating. Those numbers may renormalize. Uh, I think, though, I think just know with the basic science knowledge, an older person is going to have a more difficult time reconstituting the levels and proportion of naive T cells. And I think there is a publication that I that I included in a PowerPoint for you that I can send you over. Um, so what, what is what is definition of old in that case? Like above sixty, above forty? Like what uh, what would you call older and harder to bounce back? Um, so it, it's not going to be a, a totally linear, of course, uh, with the age. But I would say something like uh, something like fifties and sixties and up. I know that in um, one one paper from the um, from the Crotty Lab in San Diego. Mortarbacher at all. They looked and they saw, you know, it was it, it was older populations of people of people that had less uh, naive T cells, and those actually were found to correspond with more severe disease. So I think it's going to be around, you know, it, it depends on your T cells, of course. Um, some people are old, but they have what look like, you know, very very fresh T cells. It all depends on the person. Um, and actually, that was some of my um, PhD work as well, was looking at um, adults and looking at their T cells, uh, the differentiation states of their T cells. And I saw just, uh, just a huge spread uh, between people that had, you know, very young looking T cells and then people that had quite old and differentiated T cells. Um, Did that and correlate also, with their with their physical health? Would you say like um, were you able? Thing to is, I didn't. Well, I didn't know their physical health exactly when I got these donors, but they were all presumed to be healthy donors. Except I had a few um, cancer patients that had uh, had gone through chemo and had their T cells, and they were quite aged and differentiated actually. So I could. It was significant and kind of obvious, you know, if someone had cancer before, and um, then I then I was able to look at their T cells. So uh, it's going to be a problem also for people who've gone through rounds of chemotherapy and other things. So um, we've gone over the life cycle of a T cell, you know, especially there seems a correlation with the population of naive T cells and your overall health. Um, that's what other scientists are saying as well. Um, what do you think, um, does it matter how severe the SARS-CoV-2 infection you get? Um, would that, um, you know, especially with the factors you were mentioning, if someone gets a mild illness, just uh, upper respiratory illness, um, have you seen any evidence that that hit on the immune system is less severe than for other people who get like the flu-like or, or more severe symptoms like pulmonary damage, et cetera? Yeah, so I'm, I'm of the opinion that a lot of that pulmonary damage and severe disease is a manifestation of the highly cytotoxic state of the T cells. So people, um, and there was, a, there was a publication claiming that the mild illness in children um, was, was well correlated also with a less cytotoxic uh, T cell function in those infections. So I think, I think yeah, it's sort of a direct manifestation. You know, a lot of the um, damage is mediated by the immune system. And in order to become like very cytotoxic and cause that damage, uh, you're going to need that the cells will need the immune system cells, T cells, would need a lot of differentiation and um, a lot of exuberant function. So absolutely, they're gonna. That's going to be a proxy for someone who's had, you know, a, a highly pushed, you know, T cell differentiation state. All the damage. Um, one thing is um, we've seen, especially um, 
among some sources are touting T cells as our savior. Um, like when it comes to infection, like, you know, uh, our vaccines were pretty good up against uh, Delta and uh, variants previous to that. And then Omicron sort of sails back right through the antibody barrier. And then now, you know, especially, you know, the usual sources are saying, you know, don't worry, our T cells will handle it. What your message is saying is that the T cells are actually, in many cases, especially if you're older, are in trouble. Like they'll, especially if you're more differentiated, you're older, you're uh, in poorer health, um, and even middle age, like uh, because 50s or 60s is not that old, it, your T cells are basically, um, can be your worst enemy in this case. Would you say that's an yeah. accurate take? They're a double-edged sword, certainly. I mean, the T cells are almost like, um, when things go well, you can point to the T cells and say, okay, well, maybe they did their function. But when they go bad, you can also point to the T cells and say, okay, they were acting too exuberantly and they caused a lot of um, nonspecific damage or damage to the infected cells. So T cells, um, they're not always protective. And we've had a few publications that have, that have highlighted this most recently. I've been saying it, it a long time because I, I was just looking at the basic science and kind of projecting and I was like, oh boy, okay. Okay, T cells are exerting harm in some cases. And now they're seeing this um, because they're trying to understand what is happening. And, and now, um, unfortunately, it's not, only, it's not only all the immunopathology that's happening. Now we're seeing all the blood clots and things that are happening. Like, um, I don't know what, what the mediator of that is, but um, as far as um, tissue damage from infection goes and a lot of um, you know, things that are consequence to T cell activity, those, you know, those are, uh, that, that mechanism is still, is still remains. I don't know the mechanism for the, uh, the clots and things. Um, one thing is, um, you've mentioned something called a super antigen, and uh, you talked about the furin cleavage site. What does that mean exactly? Um, what is a super antigen, and why is it, why is it dangerous to us? And, why, and it seems to be present on uh, SARS-CoV-2. So the super antigen is something that can activate our T cells non-specifically. So any T cell, not any T cell. Um, so a T cell that's not specific to the virus, if it's in proximity to viral antigen, and namely the super antigen, if it's if it's um, if it's near, uh, it can it can interact um, in a way. I think I think the super antigen will kind of link and stimulate, uh, you know, be able to send a ligation signal to the T cell receptor on the CD8 T cell. And um, that, will, that will make this, the CD8 T cell think that it's seen the viral sequence or the cancer sequence or what, what have you. Um, it makes it think and believe that it sees the sequence that it's specific to. So that T cell will act. And when it's a CD8 T cell, what acting means is basically, um, you know, killing. So it'll be a non-specific activation. So um, when you get a lot of non-specific activation, you can end up getting a lot of damage. And I think that's that's exhibited well by MISC. You know, the 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 um, syndrome of non-specific T cell activation mediated by the superantigen. Now they say it's very delayed. You know, it's a it's a delayed syndrome, and it is. But that delay may be because the antigen is in the gut and it's relatively shielded, um, you know, and it's, it takes a while for the immune system to see that antigen. But when the antigen, when the super antigen is in the lungs, and ORF8 may also be super antigenic, uh, you'll, get another, you'll get some more nonspecific T cell activation. And that recent German paper, uh, paper out of Germany, um, I think it was in Cell, um, it shows that complement is also activating the T cells non-specifically. Now I knew I was seeing non-specific T cell activation because no virus was going to do that to the. We were looking at whole blood, not even, not even T cells that were specific to um, the virus. When you look at, you know, in in infection, it looks like so many of the T cells are stimulated, and I knew that you know that was not that was a sort of non-specific activation going on. I thought predominantly it was the super antigen. It may still be um, super antigenic stimulation, but it looks like complement is also doing this, which is um, very interesting, a very big finding. And um, I, I wish I kind of had all the mechanism right, you know, that it was also complement activation, non-specific activation of the T cells. But I find the new paper very compelling, and I, I think it's a, it's a great addition to understand 
understanding the immunopathology of the infection. I guess it would explain why some of the um, immune modulating drugs work, like tocilizumab and baricitinib too. Um, one thing, sure. yeah, one thing is, um, so the super antigens can activate like a huge portion of your T cells versus a natural infection. Like, you know, a natural infection gets you like, you know, 0.1 or 1% of your T cells. A super antigen can activate like 20, 30, I think 100%, right, of your T cells. Is that right? Yeah, so um, anti-CD3 is like an is like an antibody that you can use, um, and that will activate all. It's a super antigen, sort of. That'll activate all your T cells. Um, so, so yeah, that you can you can activate a high high amount of T cells with super antigen, um, and I wonder what proportion of the T cells will be able to be. I think it was the yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just a lot. Like, let's say 70, 80% for, I don't know how many for, um, I don't know how many for the SCB super antigen uh, specifically, but um, I think it's 20%. For that one, maybe. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. The evidence is there. That there's a lot of nonspecific activation. And uh, when you have that, you're going to have nonspecific cell killing mediated by the T cells. And so you kind of want to, if you're going to, if you're going to target that for therapy, you kind of want to hold those T cells back in a way, especially if it's a person with um, a highly differentiated repertoire and a low amount of naive T cells, because those naive T cells are going to soak up some of the signal. There's a, there's a concept in immunology um, in T cell immunology called cytokine sinks. And what that is, is specific um, certain, certain T cells or certain immune cells will act as sinks for um, other cytokines and signals. Now, here's the thing. So that, that CD95 uh, and the CD95 ligand, those aren't cytokines uh, per se, but naive T cells will act like sinks for the, um, it's CD178 for the fast ligand. Um, so what they'll do is they'll take up that differentiation signal. Um, so that so when they when those naive T cells are around to take up that differentiation signal, that differentiation signal isn't happening to the uh, to the T cells that are differentiated enough to actually become highly highly cytotoxic. So you can end up dampening uh, physiologically. Well, this is just how it works. Uh, the physiological system of um, effector acquisition is dampened by the CD95 expressing, you know, younger T cells. They're not, when they're naive T cells, they don't express 95, CD95. That's actually what we call uh, T stem cell memory. Those will start expressing CD95. They'll soak up that signal almost like a cytokine sink and prevent a high amount of effector differentiation. And I tried to illustrate that in the, um, that one paper that I published earlier. Um, I think I'm, I'm writing another one right now and I'll more clearly explain this whole system, because it's not something that um, it's not something that was entirely relevant to cancer immunotherapy. I mean, it was published a little bit about it, but uh, the implications for infectious disease and quorum sensing of T cells were not were not uh, published upon. You know, I just got I went back to medical school and I got busy. Um, so I'll, I'll it's try kind to of like uh, it's kind of like carbon in a nuclear reactor, right? Like. Uh... It sort of absorbs, you know, the stuff that might cause a runaway reaction. Would you say that's a good analogy? That's a great analogy. I wish I had thought of it. <laughs> um, so basically, if you're older, if you have more differentiated T cells, because you your T cells, you've been around longer and you fought off more diseases and more cancers in your body, your ability to absorb and survive the massive activation of your T cells caused by SARS-CoV-2 is a lot less. Basically. That's a fantastic summary. Yep. So that's, you've explained basically why older people get much more severe disease with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. I can explain it in part by this mechanism, I believe. It's, the, it's theoretical. I mean, I've shown the mechanism in vitro. It's been published, um, but it has not been applied specifically to infectious disease, and I need to work on that and publish. I know I told you um, I, that I wanted to, you know, maybe get less Twitter cred and more publications because that's what I need at this stage, don't I? But I knew that um, I wanted to help you. I, I know that you're uh, a frontline worker and I wanted to help everybody else. So I wanna explain this before um, I do go on and publish it because you guys are very deserving of it. No, thank you. You know, and I, I, I take some hope from what you were telling us basically. I assume that naive T cells are a fixed resource and um, that once they're gone, they're gone. But your body, if you're younger, can regenerate. So 
Is it is that possible? If you're younger and your thymus is working, yeah, you'll you'll still kick out naive T cells. Um, I as far as I understand, yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, as you get older, um, it's almost like a built-in obsolescence. I mean, some people do argue, and there are some publications that will say there's still naive T cells coming out of things like um, um, like the uh, tonsils and some other lymphoid organs. Um, but it's it's unusual, and I haven't looked closely at those publications. But um, but yeah, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a sloughing of any tissue. You know, when you get old, your skin starts wrinkling. You know, your organs organ function declines. Your T cell repertoire also is aged, and you know, it's not as um, it's not as good as it used to be. But paradoxically, paradoxically, when you're older. Um, your T cells are in the phenotype of more, um, they're closer to that effector function, that killing that we're talking about. So, um, I mean, they may, they may also have a more, um, more exhausted phenotype as well, but regardless, uh, they're in that effector, they're, they're in the memory stage uh, predominantly um, with less naive T cells. So they're actually more poised for a little bit more uh, cytotoxic activity. So it's a little bit paradoxical, uh, but you can just reconcile it with the knowledge of how the T cell, uh, how, how a T cell differentiates and then finally functions. One thing is, are there other diseases that cause this kind of uh, T cell aging or depletion like uh, that you've seen? Like can a bad flu do the same thing? Can you bounce back from that? So, um, so looking at the differentiation states, um, what I've seen, and this is just from, from my own reading, and I'm not a virologist, so I can't really, and I'm more of a cancer immunologist too, cancer T cell immunologist. But from what I've seen, um, and what uh, John Wary has published uh, out of University of Pennsylvania, so that highly, um, there, there's like a signature of genetics there, there's like a gene signature in severe cases of, of COVID-19 when they look at the T cells. Um, and they see that it's quite similar to Ebola infection. And so in Ebola infection, there's also super antigenic stimulation. And this is, um, I mean, this isn't all tied together, you know, it's, uh, it's just a loose association that I have and it's speculative. But in Ebola um, infection, the T cells inside the blood um, there's a high degree of just chaos and a lot of interferon secretion and uh, lympho collapse and death. And a lot of it is mediated by CD95 uh, and CD95 ligand. Um, basically, Ebola infection is one of the most dramatic uh, collapses of the T cell compartment that you can have. And it's, it's paired with, you know, an extreme amount of death and what looks like maybe cytotoxic function to me. Uh, there certainly is a lot of um, interference and stuff. The Ebola survivors, however, they have, what they have is a competent and coordinated T cell response that is earlier and that actually prevents them from dying. So, um, so yeah, so, so another, another, another thing similar uh, published by John Wary, John Wary's group, uh, what he sees is a similar genetic uh, signature as as Ebola, um, oh, no. and I'm not I'm not really aware of the um, the differentiation states of uh, flu infection influenza, but I'd be interested in looking. Well, um, one more thing, um, you mentioned um, that you've seen T cells in the in the, in tissues where you usually don't see infection and other things like in the brain. And how extraordinary is that that you're seeing um, cytotoxic T cells in neural tissue? So there, there were some, um, you know, I, I, I made like a comment because there's a nice figure that shows, you know, they looked at the brain parenchyma and people that died of either influenza or SARS-CoV-2. And they saw that there were T cell infiltrates in the people with SARS-CoV-2, but not, not the people who died of lethal influenza. Okay, that is very unusual. And I was quite worried about that before because, you know, um, it's a super antigenic infection and it's also so close to the brain. And then there's, there's a lot of uh, debate on whether the, the virus is able to actually, you know, enter the cranium and be inside the brain or be inside the nerves or, or in the uh, infecting the cells that support the nerves. 
Um, but regardless, when you have a T cell infiltrate going into the brain, um, that is bad because it's going to exert a lot of killing. I mean, those T cells, uh, if they're CD8 T cells too, they're, they're not going to be there to, to be nice. They're going to be stimulated and start killing things. Um, and to see that it doesn't happen at all in flu, you know, well, those comparisons to influenza aren't very valid. There were some pedants, you know, people that were pedantic that said, oh, look, no, actually there's tissue resident, you know, T cells in the brain. Well, no, we're talking about infiltrating T cells, you know, not t tissue resident T cells that may have already been there. Um, we're actually doing uh, comparisons between influenza and between uh, in one publication between influenza and between SARS-CoV-2. So it is, it is highly unusual. Um, and it was a nature paper. And then there was a recent paper with all those, um, the autopsy studies that also showed, uh, I think to 70 to 80% of um, infiltrate of cases of deaths had infiltrating T cells. Yeah, I mean, we're not comparing, we're not saying, oh yeah, they just had more tissue resonant T cells. No, that's not the comparison. You can look at what the T cells express, you know, on their surface to see if they were tissue resident or not. Um, so that's just a little bit of downplaying that some people were doing. No, it's a highly unusual infection in all these things that we're seeing. Um, you know, the amount of, um, I actually made um, an error in one interview. Someone asked me, oh, like, so let's talk about brain disease in general and heart disease and diabetes. Like, what do you think is caused by viruses versus, you know, not? And I said, well, diabetes and heart disease. Well, that, you know, Western diet is a big problem with that. Um, I didn't know. I don't, I still don't know if they were referring to type one diabetes or, um, you know, just cardiac injury from infection. Absolutely. The type one diabetes that we're seeing, the immune mediated diabetes, that's from, that's from SARS-CoV-2 infection, in my opinion. OK, because it's activating the immune system uh, so much and causing a lot of autoimmunity. And it's also messing up the, um, the T cells that are responsible for quelling autoimmunity, uh, the CD4 T regulatory cells. Those are messed up by SARS-CoV-2. So absolutely, when those uh, organs like the, the pancreas get, um, get infiltrated by T cells or have some uh, response to maybe circulating cytokine or um, autoantibodies, those, those cells that are producing insulin are going to start dying. Um, I do believe that SARS-CoV-2 is causing a type 1 diabetes um, and could be causing cardiac injury and, and what have you. You know what's so interesting? That, uh, my colleagues have seen an uptick in Graves' disease as well. In the oh. Last while. So that could be the same mechanism, actually, along oh, with the kids with um, diabetes as well. Absolutely. So I thought um, someone asked me, like, okay, so what's the diagnosis going to be? What, what's it going to be? Um, and I said, well, I'm seeing, you know, it looks like a global autoimmunity. So I have no idea what clinical syndrome it's going to be. You know, it would just be, uh, you can call it whatever clinical syndrome occurs. I guess Graves disease is manifesting, uh, type 1 diabetes is manifesting. Um, but when you have so many autoantibodies and you've turned the T cells that are responsible for stopping autoimmunity into, into T cells that cause autoimmunity, um, then you're just going to have, you pick your clinical syndrome, you know, whatever it's going to be. I mean, I know I mean, that any Epstein of them, yeah. yeah, Epstein Barr, they're seeing, um, you know, implicated in MS, multiple sclerosis. Uh, so um, I know that some people that, you know, they pass with MS, they've found, um, you know, the, the uh, sequences of EBV in the brain. Um, you might want to check on that. I think that's pretty much a recent finding, but, um, but oh, yeah, we have no idea what SARS-CoV-2 is going to do. It might, it really might do so much. I remember, um, you know, just to wrap up our conversation a, a while ago when we were trading messages, like what would it take um, to stop this virus? You mentioned something like a Manhattan Project like effort. I noticed that sort of a, a hack that the Israelis have discovered is just boost everyone every four months or five months. Like, what do you think, is that going to work for, uh, going to keep us safe until a better solution comes? And what is a better solution, do you think? So that's a, that's a good question. Mm, so I think I view, I, I see it almost like, I hate, to, I hate to fall back on the cancer, but I see it almost like a, a cancer problem where, you know, if, if someone's diagnosed with cancer, you want them to live out, to live longer with a good quality of life. Um, and maybe in the future, there will be some better options. You know, um, it's, it's great when you have an extra six months and for the older populations, 
um, it, it's great to protect them and give everybody, you know, some more time, you know, for more things to come. I think that we need to use these, uh, even if we have to boost like that, like Israel's doing, I think it should be done for the populations because our technology is going to be better. I am disappointed there is not a global Manhattan project for SARS-CoV-2. I wish it would happen um, because we need to find something that we can we can disseminate, especially to all the um, to the low uh, the low income countries and the um, the socioeconomically disadvantaged countries. We need something, and we need an infrastructure. We need an infrastructure to be able to deliver the solution, and we need a solution for it, and, or something better. Um, right now, we have these we, these vaccines, which are great, but unfortunately, we're not we're not disseminating them quick enough. If we had in, in theory, and, and this is just like, uh, this is like the dream scenario. In the dream scenario, we would have had uh, ample supply of the mRNA vaccine that was to the, the Wuhan 1.0, and it still would have been Wuhan 1.0 because we would have coordinated um, globally efforts. You know, maybe rich countries would have helped out poor countries with infrastructure and things, and they all would have scaled up and then bam, hit it all over the head with a hammer at the same time. And that would have stopped, you know, the evolution of this, uh, this virus occurring and stopped a lot of the immune escape. So in, in, in an ideal world, which we unfortunately do not have yet or do not have, uh, we would have a global uh, supply chain and, and um, global manufacturing to disseminate uh, whatever solution we have, and we may need a solution, you know, created. I don't know if it's going to be like some some single lab that does it, but but something something that that's excellent that that works for uh, many of the variants, like the uh, the pan coronavirus vaccine. Um, I know I know the U.S. Uh, the U.S. government. I think it was U.S. Amrid maybe has found one, and uh, hopefully they they scale up production and we can disseminate that quick enough. But yeah, I am disappointed. There's not a um, a sort of Manhattan project for this because uh, it's going to keep coming and, and all this autoimmune, all these autoimmune issues and these other issues aren't going to go away. Even if you have, even if you've compensated to agree a degree, you know, that um, there's, there's a whole uh, in, in medicine, there's the whole thing of compensation and then decompensation. Well, we're, what we'll see is we'll see immune systems compensating, you know, they'll, they'll be cranking out antibodies and you'll have effector T cells and, you know, they'll, you'll have memory T cells that are poised to go. But with that, 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 um, that system is not totally completely self renewing and without aging, there will be, you know, with every six months, you're infected by another variant of SARS CoV 2, there's going to be decompensation. And it's going to, you know, we're not, we're not ready for that, I think, I think our global population is not, uh, will have, you know, a great decrease in, um, life expectancy and some people are seeing that and and actually some uh you know some life insurance company i think published that uh, uh that that excess death is is up you know from the age 30 to 60 it's it's gone quite up and it's going to be for everyone too so so yeah we have a huge so that, that points points to the if there is no global manhattan project to sort of the, that's the dark future right like we all get recurrently infected with SARS-CoV-2, our immune systems keep taking hits, and we all prematurely age. And that's that's the sort of the dark end of things, I guess. Eh? Yeah, my, my fear is that a large amount of us, a high proportion, will have long COVID. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people echo that. And people with long COVID are trying to warn us, too. They're saying, you don't want this. You know, we, you need to do something. We need to do something because this is, uh, this is going to disable many people. Yeah, it's disappointing, and I, I hope we do something. Uh, I hope something happens. I hope uh, you know, we can get your message out there. Thank you so much uh, for spending time with us. Um, you know, I know it's uh, in the afternoon for you, but uh, I'll, um, we're gonna you know clean this up and then get it out there hopefully. But I hope uh, you know, I hope your message rings out loud and clear and people listen. Thanks, Dr. Pizzotta. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a great day. Bye.